No bloco de notas de hoje, eu estou no campo Sorocaba, da UFSCar, para uma conversa com Patrícia Hill Collins, socióloga, professora da Universidade de Maryland, nos Estados Unidos, e referência nos estudos de raça e gênero. Daqui a pouco, ela faz a palestra Interseccionalidade, Desafios Contemporâneos e Novas Perspectivas, mas antes, nós conversamos com Patricia Hill Collins. Patricia, thank you very much for sparing this time to talk to us. It's very important to me, and I'm sure it will be important to our public too. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, I would like you to present the concept of intersectionality for those who have never heard about it. What does it help us understand and explain? Intersectionality helps us understand all of the different ways that race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, age, religion affect everyone's lives. These systems are often invisible. They are organized within our social institutions. They affect our families. They affect our communities. But they are not visible to us on a daily basis. What intersectionality does is it takes one or more of these systems and says they are interconnected. So if you have something like um, in the U.S. as we do, a situation of um, family separation, some families that can't stay together for one reason or another, you can look at that as a gender issue or you can look at that as a race issue or you can look at that as a class issue. But in order to fully understand that issue, you have to think about how all three work together. To say a bit more about that, we have many children in foster care. For a variety of reasons, their parents cannot take care of them. And part of that has to do with class in terms of poverty, but some of that has to do with gender, in terms of their mother, the situation of their mothers and the quality of health care that women get. And some of that has to do with their race because we have racial discrimination in the United States. So if you were to only look at one thing, uh, the age of the child, and ask yourself, all we need to do is pay attention to the age of the child, that would not be enough to really understand the issue of children in foster care or family separation more generally, it would be important to see how all of those systems shaped that particular situation. So that's one thing. You've first written about it almost 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. What has changed since then? What does it mean talking about uh, new challenges or new perspectives about intersectionality nowadays? I think intersectionality very much started as part of black feminism. So black women were one of the first to bring these ideas to public attention. The ideas of intersectionality have been within black women's communities for quite some time without carrying that name of intersectionality. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, was a period of time when the idea of intersectionality moved into public space. What has changed quite a bit is how many other groups have also seen how their experiences have been shaped by intersectionality as well. So that it is not something that is special and peculiar to black women. It takes a particular form for black women, but it also affects um, indigenous women or it also in affects men of different social classes who also are living with ideas of race, sex, class, gender, sexuality, and age. So what's happened in the last 30 years that's been very good is um, a growing acceptance by many, many groups, both in the United States and globally, of these ideas. What has also changed in the last 30 years is the naming of intersectionality and its popularity have made it very much a target for um, conservative groups because intersectionality has been initially put forth 
by many, many groups who are on the bottom of different societies. So it's different. The form that intersectionality takes among black women in Britain, for example, differs from black women in Brazil. But the reaction to those groups within their societies uh, is very much the same. The, the determination for black women, among others, not to uh, do well. So one thing that has changed the moment of now, the conservative moment that we're in now, is very much an attack on people of color, of gay lesbian folk, of women, of uh, uh, black people, of poor people, all of the groups that over time have recognized that they have a common struggle and have organized under the banner of intersectionality. So that's changed as well. And uh, considering this, that it affects all people, or yes. it's present for all, all people, I have a question which is almost personal. How does intersectionality or thinking about intersectionality and empowerment mm -hmm. can help me as a white woman or can it inform my relationship to other women, mm -hmm. black, not black, transgender, inclusive, and also to men and to those who hold power? The ideas of intersectionality very much start with individual identity. The recognition that each of us is shaped by these systems. We, it's not that black women are shaped by racism. Women are shaped, white women are shaped by racism. One important idea in intersectionality is the notion of both and. You can be simultaneously privileged and disadvantaged. One person can be both of those things. So that a man can be privileged by his uh, race, excuse me, privileged by his gender, and disadvantaged by his, his race. White women can be privileged by their race and disadvantaged by their gender. This whole combination of thinking of oneself not as being a pure victim or being a pure, um, I don't know, bad person, if it were a privileged person, says that we all have to think about the combinations of those things within each of us and that have shaped our own experiences. And from that constant growth, that's not an overnight recognition. It's not, it doesn't come overnight. But through that steady uh, commitment to something bigger, to becoming a bigger person, a better person, you see all of the ways in which you may be making life harder or easier for other people. And that means you also see possibilities for what would work for you as an individual or not work for you as an individual. What you can do something about and what you cannot do something about. So it's a way of thinking about the world, moving through the world, learning about the world, and never assuming that you, that you know everything. Always learning from other people whose experiences differ from yours. Uh, and that's really what I think is at the heart of what it can do for an individual. Thank you very much for explaining me that. And uh, now I will change a little bit the subject and talk uh, specifically about intellectual activism. In your book, you've written on intellectual activi activism, <laughs> you've written about, uh, sp spoken and written about uh, telling the truth to power mm -hmm. and to the people. Yes. What's the difference? Why is it important? And also, how do you see academics around the world or in the U.S. performing this task nowadays? Mm. Let me talk first about the difference between the two. For me, speaking the truth to power is finding ways to talk back to powerful ideas, structures, institutions, rules, and people who are dedicated to remaining powerful and who are dedicated to having other people have less power. So speaking the truth to power is really saying something like racism is wrong or sexism is wrong or um, persecution and hate speech and crimes against transgendered folk is wrong. 
It's wrong that we have poor people who live in the streets in the U.S. We should not have that. It's wrong. These things are wrong. So speaking the truth to power is a way to intervene in that whole power structure. But the language of power is often one that is very difficult to access because power operates through barriers, through keeping people out of universities like this one, keeping people not healthy so it is difficult for them to actually speak the truth to power. And sometimes power operates just through violence, through the gun, that kind of thing. Now, somebody has to speak the truth to power. So the issue of getting inside power in order to think about our institutions and how they could be better is very much what education does. And that to me is what I do in terms of intellectual activism and speaking the truth to power. At the same time, you can get swallowed up in those institutions and forget all of the people who are not there. All of the people who actually are the people who are experiencing these issues, these problems, who are dealing with uh, the consequences of unjust power relations. So finding ways to speak the truth to people is often saying the same kinds of things, but in a way that people can hear and that matter in their lives. My own work on black feminist thought looks in both directions. It speaks the truth to power because a lot of what I do, I write in academic discourse. I am a social theorist. I manage that particular material. I know how to do that. But much of my work also takes the ideas that are the most powerful and important ideas and tries to find a way to speak the truth to people, to ordinary everyday people, to the best of my ability. And that is one reason I think my work on black feminism has been so well received by people, because people can understand it. It doesn't seem like it's long, you know, difficult theoretical work that gives you a headache, right? It's, it's asking questions that really matter. So that to me is the distinction between speaking the truth to power as an academic, as I am, and speaking the truth to people. Now your second question was, how are academics doing yeah. in this job of speaking the truth to power? <laughs> and I think the record there is uneven. Right? Mm -hmm. I think I have many wonderful colleagues who try to speak the truth to power and have great difficulty doing so for a variety of reasons. It doesn't mean they don't care. It means it's really difficult to do. However, I also have many other colleagues who could care less about this. They love things the way they are. What they want are, is for things to stay the same to not ruffle their lives in any way. And they are a problem to many of us. But we all have to work together in the academy, at least for now. So that's what I would say to that. In Sao Paulo, you've written on a wall at SESC the message, the future is ours. I said this, that you was two stay weeks strong. ago. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to end this conversation now, I would like you to talk a little about what you've seen in Brazil till now, which experiences you would highlight and why among all messages you've chosen Ooh. this one to write in this world. I wrote that one because of something that happened when I was in Brasilia, I think three years ago. I've been to Brazil maybe five or six times now and obviously well, it's not obvious, I just want to say I love Brazil <laughs> a lot, okay. I keep coming back. If I didn't love it, I would not come back. <laughs> but the experience was at the University of Brasilia, I believe, where the students there, there were a group of black students who had occupied a classroom space. They had taken over this space. This is when the high school students and the college students were demanding, making demands about their own education here in Brazil. They saw how important their education was. And to me, they are so much the future. In the US, you are ahead of us. That's how I would describe this. I think the students here really understood the meaning of their education. And when things began to be taken away, they pushed back. 
The experience for me was going into their space that they created. They took over a classroom, they made it a free space, and all around the walls of their classroom, anyone who came and who visited with them was invited to sign on the wall. Uh, and it was a space of wonderful dialogue and conversations. They were not sure what their future was going to be. It didn't matter. What mattered was that they were going to try to build that future for themselves that they wanted. That experience with those young people left me smiling, fearful for them, because I know what's involved, but also extremely excited about the possibilities for the future. So what that has done for me has been for me to think about Brazil as a place of possibilities and of the future, regardless of what's going on in the present. A place where there is so much talent and so much youth and so much energy um, last weekend I was at the festival and heard the hip-hop poets. They were the future too. I'm really impressed with that. So when I was at Seski and I wrote The Future Belongs to Us, I believe. To you. The future is ours. The future is ours. What I was saying is, it's mine too, but I don't have as much of it as you do. So the future is ours, but it's yours to change and to claim. And that's really what I meant. Patricia, <laughs> thank you very, very much for being here, for this uh, conversation. Even if it was very short, I've learned a lot and it's, it has truly been an ah. honor and fun. Obrigada para mim também. Obrigada. E para quem se interessou, tome nota. O livro, o primeiro livro da Patrícia Hill Collins, que foi lançado em 1990, Pensamento Feminista Negro, Consciência, Conhecimento e Política de Empoderamento, está sendo lançado em português em uma primeira tradução, lançado pela editora Boitempo. E a gente se vê no próximo bloco de notas. Música